Chapter Eight of the Boy Scouts in Front of Warsaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Boys in Front of Warsaw, or In the Wake of War, by George Durston. Chapter Eight. The Secret Chamber. It was a vast apartment of stone but the rugged walls were nearly covered with the most rare and beautiful hangings curtains tapestries and strange oriental rugs numerous paintings apparently of great value also hung about or stood on the floor leaning against the wall the stone floor was deep with rugs and fine furs a number of couches wide and comfortable were set here and there and one corner of the room was hidden by a great black and gold screen from this corner came the comforting odor of coffee Professor Morris sniffed it with joy in the center of the ceiling hung a simple drop light of great power Illuminating the place with almost the glare of sunlight Beneath the light stood a large table littered with magazines papers and articles of value Beside it in a deep easy chair sat a woman she was about 40 years of age and beautiful her garments were very rich and she sat listlessly leaning her head on her hand for she had been weeping at her side evidently bent on comforting her mistress knelt a woman in the costume of a servant a footman in livery stood at attention behind her chair even in that strange sunless underground place everything in sight confused though it was gave evidence of immense wealth and luxury after the dark blank twisted passages and the horrors so lately escaped in the room above them the scene seemed unreal enough to be a dream as they appeared through the small square in the floor and stood in a hesitating group the lady in the easy chair leaned forward and looked at them earnestly their guide the young girl pressed the spring that replaced the flagstone and as soon as she was quite sure that it was adjusted ran eagerly across the wide space and knelt at the lady's knee she spoke rapidly and excitedly in Polish Evelyn could catch a word occasionally then the lady rose and advanced with a graceful gesture of welcome You are indeed welcome she said easily in English I cannot be thankful enough that my daughter overheard those brutal soldiers and was able to rescue you come and tell me about it Professor Morris bowed low over the hand extended him then leading the way the lady returned to the table where the footman drew chairs for the group Professor Morris told his story of the arrest and imprisonment and the result of the conference in the dining room the lady shuddered You are safe now at least she assured him when the story was finished and we are happy to have you with us It is a comfort to have someone with whom to share one's sorrows one has no happiness to share now She smiled sadly I am the princess Olga Nicolani With my husband and children. I have lived here all my life The prince is with his troops living or dead. I know not our son is with him when the war separated us I Modjeska here and my baby girl with a few of our old servants remained in Warsaw We were perfectly safe until the bombardment of the city commenced then we decided to escape if possible we clothed ourselves plainly and under cover of darkness crept from the house the first night All lights were out and we reached the corner safely We had planned to go down to the river front where we had a motorboat in which we planned to escape But just as we turned into the river street we were met by a maddened crowd of citizens all rushing to safety They met us like a great wave Mojeska and the servants were crushed against the building but I was thrown down and for a moment stunned When the crowd had passed my people assisted me to consciousness, but oh my heart my heart How can I tell? She hid her face in her hands and shuddered Majeska clasped her mother in her arms murmuring loving words of comfort in a moment the princess looked up You can imagine our agony professor Morris when we found that our baby was gone She had been torn from me in the crowd we could not find her we searched all night then they brought me home here by a secret passage and the men hastened to bring down everything movable of value and comfort we have plenty of light because we have our own electric light system 
and this building was not struck by shell or bomb the secret passage through which Majeska brought you was revealed to me by my husband the prince his father had taught him the way and not long before the war we carefully taught our two elder children the secret springs and all the turnings i do not know why Majeska happened to venture along those dark passages to the dining room i don't know either mother said Majeska shyly i had a strange feeling that i had to go something seemed to drag me there did you hear the conversation asked professor morris part of it answered Majeska enough to tell me that something terrible was going on i was wild with fright i did not know how i could help you until i heard that dreadful man say that he and the other officer would go out for half an hour he told them they could not escape because the windows were barred and the door guarded then at first when i pressed the spring the panel would not open something had rusted i worked and worked before it slid back a moment later would have been too late said the professor shaking his head this room is absolutely safe said the princess there are seven or eight of these chambers about fifty feet from the house under the garden so compose yourself and rest i cannot leave half the city is searching for my baby i can do nothing but sit here in agony and pray for her return i know she is dead i almost pray that she is but how can i ever rest until i know she bent her head and sobbed Professor Morris cleared his throat. I do not doubt that the infant is safe, madame. No one would deliberately molest a helpless baby. She wasn't really a baby, said Majeska. Mother calls her that because she was so tiny. She could walk and talk a little, too. Don't say was, cried the princess. Don't talk as if she was dead. No, mother darling, no, soothed the girl. How old is she? asked Evelyn. The princess again controlled herself. Rika, she had no chance to continue. Rika, cried Professor Morris and Evelyn and Jack and again. Rika. Evelyn reached inside her blouse and pulled out a heavy gold chain hung with a splendid diamond ornament. Is this yours? She cried. The princess took one look, then seized Evelyn by the shoulders. Yes, yes, she cried chokingly. Tell me where she is. Have you seen my baby? Tell me, tell me. Evelyn said the thing quickest. She is with my sister, and I think they are safe, she cried. The princess gave a deep sigh and fainted quietly away. It was a long time before she recovered, and then she wanted to be told over and over all about little Rika, how she had looked, how she had borne the separation, everything. The Morrises, having been assured by Ivan that Warren was on the track of the men who had kidnapped the children, and knowing the cleverness and determination that Warren always put into everything he ever did, were positive that Warren had the children safely in his possession. And Evelyn knew well that once with him, they would not get out of his sight again. All of this she used to comfort the princess, who could scarcely contain herself for joy. Now it will all come out right, she said. When the men come back next time, we can set them to hunting up your son and Prince Ivan. And we will soon be reunited She clapped her hands softly and the footman approached Luncheon Michael she said and the professor watched with pleasure the speed with which the princess was obeyed Soon they were eating a delicious and much-needed meal The princess herself was so strengthened by the tonic of hope and joy that she was able to enjoy the delicate food She could not hear enough about Rika and at every sound declared that the men must be returning although Mojeska reminded her over and over that they were unlikely to return before dark. The afternoon wore on, Professor Morris and Evelyn glad to rest after the recent shocks, and Jack playing games with Mojeska, while the princess walked restlessly about the vast chamber, constantly looking at her watch. Finally, she said joyfully, It must be growing dark now. The men will soon return, and we will send them to your house, where the boys and your little daughter will be waiting with my baby Rika, Oh, how can I ever be thankful enough to you for your goodness to her? Professor Morris smiled. Considering the fact that Miss Majeska has saved all our lives, he said, I think that you need feel under no obligations to us. We were delighted to entertain the little Rika. I am positive that my son will have them in safety somewhere, so you really need not worry. I do not. Evelyn suppressed a smile. She was quite sure her father did not worry. 
He was always ready to let someone else do the worrying for him Suddenly a silver knob fastened to the wall dropped from its place and swung back and forth on a thin chain They have come cried the princess She rushed across the room and as the footman drew aside one of the heavy hangings She pressed with all her might on a rough spot in the granite wall as in the case of the flooring the wall itself parted and slowly swung open in the dark opening stood not one of the well-known house servants but a slight figure covered with dirt and grime he was tattered and barefooted under the dirt his pallid face looked deathly but fire blazed in the dark eyes the fire of love mother he cried don't you know me the princess gave a cry and clasped her son in a passionate embrace Ignacy she cried and Ignacy over and over while she patted him and felt of him as though to assure herself that it was not a dream Where is your father Ignacy she whispered finally as a dreadful thought pierced her I come from him said the young man wearily he is wounded mother and needs you But be brave because he will live let me sit while I tell you He sank wearily into a chair still clinging to the hand of the princess he paid no attention to the strangers but closed his eyes I Thought I would never see you again dear ones. He said huskily. I simply can't tell you now what we have been through All I can say is that in the final encounter as the enemy passed loaths my dear father was desperately wounded I missed him and searched for him when I found him. He was unconscious Mother I thought he was dead, but he lived and under cover of darkness. We carried him to the house of our aunt Francoise she has turned it into a hospital mother and all the forty rooms are filled with soldiers Well father had good care then for all the rush aunt Francoise had him taken to the hidden chapel in the east wall And it is quiet and safe, but you must come and care for him mother for there are not enough nurses by half and the men suffer so Where was he injured Ignacy answered the princess shuddering the boy hesitated Mother dear it is pretty bad, but I have seen it so much worse. He has lost his left arm The princess covered her eyes. Oh my dear my dear she murmured How can I bear this for you? It might be far worse said Ignacy cheerily. We must start back to him tonight Did you save any of the motor cars he turned to Michael? To your excellency said the man they are hidden in a haystack down past the woods at the end of the estate The large touring car and your racer good said Ignacy then suddenly where is my little Rika? At once the princess and Modjeska commenced the story of her loss and all the other events leading up to the appearance of the Morrises and the strange coincidence of their having found the little girl Ignacy listened breathlessly once more the silver knob fell someone else was coming the footman opened the stone portal and three men entered they bowed profoundly to the princess and greeted Ignace with deepest respect They had of course no news of Rika But the princess was able to impart the good news to them and to tell them that after they had eaten They could go to the Morris house and fetch the two girls Ivan and Warren back I Am not sure that we can do so tonight excellency one said there is great confusion in the house a triple guard surrounds it so far the guards are no nearer than our doorway, but if they spread their lines we will not be able to get back I Heard a soldier say that two important prisoners had slipped out from under the very eyes of the officers and could not be found They are in hiding somewhere and every effort is being made to find them They know they have not left the building He glanced suspiciously at the strangers Yes, they are here said the princess in a few words. She explained the man bowed low by your leave excellency I will take the others and go at once he said one may eat some other time perhaps We are in danger even here, and I will not feel safe until we are on our way Go then by all means said Ignace he is quite right mother and the sooner we are out of this the better Go and in the meantime we will prepare for the journey The men saluted and left silently and the princess with the woman servant and the two girls collected dark cloaks and warm rugs a bountiful lunch was prepared and packed Professor Morris holding his manuscript sat searching through one pocket after another with a mournful persistence Finally Evelyn noted him and asked what was the matter? I have lost my reading glasses. He said Can't we find them for you 
asked Majeska politely. She started to look on the rugs. They're not here, said the professor. I heard the case fall out of my pocket when we were coming through the passage. Then we will get them, said Majeska. It will only take a minute. Would you like to come with me, Evelyn? Yes, I would, said Evelyn, who was nervous and wanted to do something. Hurry, said the princess. I know it is absolutely safe, but I can't bear one of you to be out of my sight for a moment. The passage was very cold and damp, but the girls each put on a heavy dark cloak. They threaded their way through the room that lay between the living room and the passage, and went up the narrow hallway with the flashlight illuminating the stone floor. The case was found at last, and they were turning to go back, when the sound of an explosion reached their ears, and a dim light appeared at the end of the corridor. For a moment the girls stood motionless. Then they turned and ran swiftly down the twisted way to the sliding stone, and found themselves once more in the room they had left, but it was in darkness. The electric lights were out, and the little flashlights made but a dim illumination in the room. The men had returned, and all stood staring as the two girls raced into the room and told their story. "'I think they are dynamiting the dining-room to find the prisoners. We must leave now,' cried Ignacy. "'No one knows how they may guard the grounds. They are bound to find their victims.' "'Where is Rika?' cried Majeska. "'They could find no trace of any of them,' said the princess. "'We can only hope that the boys have taken the little girls either to the American consuls or away from Warsaw. We will have to trust to them, and believe that they are all together, until we can get in touch with them. In the meantime, there is but one course open. We must go to the prince at Lodz. And at once, mother, I have a feeling that we are not safe even here. Have you your jewels? I have them all, said the princess. All that I had placed on Rika, and which Miss Evelyn has returned, and the court jewels as well. Then let us go, said Ignace. I'll lead the way, Jan. When we reach the waterfall, go ahead and see if all is safe. In perfect silence they left the room, slipping along a narrow, low passageway that at first seemed walled with stone, then gave forth a mouldy, earthy odour. Presently they heard the sound of gently falling water, and found themselves under a narrow waterfall. Again a clever spring was touched by some hand in the darkness, and one by one they emerged so close to the edge of the falling water that the spray wet them. They were in the open air once more. Ignace clasped Evelyn by the hand, and she could feel the nervous strain in his grasp. Noiseless as shadows, they slid from tree to tree through the great park, and down the grove of interlacing trees. It was a long walk. As Evelyn was wondering if she could possibly go much further, a dark, round shape appeared in the opening ahead. It was a haystack. End of chapter 8